from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. makes a country. What makes this country of ours? Let's take a swift bird's eye view to see if we can discover the ingredients. The first essential is space to live in, and we Americans have plenty of that. This republic stretches from ocean to ocean and from the Great Lakes to the Gulf. Within our borders are vast fertile plains where graze the cattle and the sheep. We have great fields of billowing grain mile on mile nodding golden heads to the sun, a giant granary. Friendly, smiling valleys are dotted with fragrant fruit trees and streaked with dusty green vineyards that march in columns over the rolling hills. We have millions of acres of timberland, oak and elm and hickory, maple and walnut, spruce and pine. Our mighty rivers toss their plumes of spray as they hurry down to the sea. Majestic mountains proudly lift their ancient snow-covered heads to the blue sky. Plenty of space to live in. But land is not enough to make a country. There must also be people to work the land, men to swing the axe and fell the timber to begin the conversion of a tree into a useful piece of lumber. There must be people to harvest the crops, cotton and wheat, corn and tobacco, oats and alfalfa, barley and beans. Now, people act pretty much alike the world over, no matter where you go. They eat and drink and discuss the news of the day. They're born, they work for their share of happiness, and they die. They feel the same heat of summer and the same chill of winter. And after work, they play. But that isn't enough. And that's why for 300 years they've been coming to this country. Our fathers or our fathers' fathers, months or years or generations ago, made the long voyage to these shores in search of freedom. For more than half a century, the Statue of Liberty, soaring symbol of America, has held high aloft a torch, brightly burning, to light the way for 26 million new Americans to this new land of opportunity, to this land of the free. And what treasures are ours? We produce 34% of all the coal mined in the world. From our wells gushes 62% of the world's supply of oil. From seemingly inexhaustible veins in the earth, we produce 29% of the world's iron ore. Other rich lodes supply us with 32% of the world's copper. In the fields of the south, we grow half of all the cotton produced. Our most valuable crop is corn, of which we grow more than half of the world's supply. To get about our great country, we operate 34% of the world's railroads, a quarter of a million miles of track. For personal transportation, we drive 70% of all the automobiles that roll along the world's highways. We enjoy the convenience of half of all the telephones in service. For diversion and instruction, we listen to 45% of all the radio sets in existence. We import into this country for our use half of all the rubber produced in other lands. From across the sea, we bring into America more than half of all the coffee grown. And from the other side of the world, we get more than half of the world's production of raw silk. And what proportion of the population of the Earth shares all these riches? There are 130 million of us Americans, but how do we compare in numbers with the rest of mankind? Well, such is the ingenuity, the courage, and the capacity for hard work of the American people that they have developed these infinite resources and still have a lot of room to grow in. For we constitute only 6% of the population of the world. Only 6%, and yet we are the wealthiest in resources as well as the happiest and freest people on Earth. We constitute the greatest country in the world, great in resources and in the vision of our people, great in accomplishment in the past, 
and equally great in promise for the future. Not so long ago, our forefathers braved unknown perils of an unknown land and crossed the continent to win the West, a triumph of courage and will to achieve. The country over, stout-hearted men and women were making homes and raising families. One gala day, the last spike was driven that laced the two oceans together with a transcontinental railway. Now the two coasts were only days apart instead of months. In 1840, a hundred years ago, a member of the United States Senate made an amazing speech. I urge the closing of the United States Patent Office. It is obvious, I think that you will concur that we have exhausted our inventiveness. And because there is nothing further to be devised and patented, no machine or contraption that can possibly add to our virtue and well-being, I crave your support of a measure to close the patent office. Close the patent office? And since that day have come inventions that have meant jobs for millions of men and women. The electric light, the telephone, the phonograph, the automobile, the airplane, the radio, and the sound motion picture. Each year, 400,000 applications for patents are filed from which come as many as 40,000 workable ideas. For well, high no further back than the turn of the century, less than four decades ago, letters were handwritten by the light of an oil lamp. Now your secretary turns out her work swiftly and legibly on the typewriter. Not so long ago, metal was shaped by the smith, and a mighty man was he, because he had to be. Nowadays, a man touches a lever, and the jaws of a giant press close on a sheet of steel to form the top of an automobile. Not so long ago, milk was skimmed by hand, but now the separator efficiently divorces the milk from the cream. Plowing used to be a slow job and a hard job not so long ago, but now American inventiveness has lightened the labors of the farmer with the tractor and the gang plow. Nature created Niagara Falls truly a beautiful spectacle, but even more magnificent is the largest man-made structure on Earth, Boulder Dam, eloquent testimony to the vision of our country. For this tremendous work will make the desert to blossom like the rose, creating garden spots where once was trackless waste. We have flung great bridges across bays and streams that people may move more easily from one place to another for the exchange of goods and ideas. Over and under rivers between the United States and the Dominion of Canada are bridges and tunnels that cross the boundary line between our good neighbor and ourselves, a 3,000 mile frontier of friendship over which not a gun has been pointed in enmity in more than a hundred years. Typically American, are our majestic cities with their towering skyscrapers of steel and stone and glass. Truly an awe-inspiring sight is Manhattan Island. In busy, bustling Chicago, millions have been spent to beautify the lakefront until it is now one of the show places of America, the gift of a generous city to its people. The national capital at Washington breathes there a man with soul so dead who never to himself has said, this is my own, my native land. This country has been called the melting pot because by some strange alchemy, a variety of ingredients goes into it. And the result of the bubbling and seething is always the same, a fresh creation, a new citizen, an American.
what makes an American? Well, there's education. Free schools for all the people. Only 150,000 of our youngsters were enrolled in institutions of higher learning 50 years ago. Now, the enrollment is 1,200,000. Then there's a free press for the uninterrupted exchange of ideas. A press that is free to speak its mind about those in power, to safeguard the rights of the lowly, to examine acts and motives of people in high places, to ensure justice for all under the Constitution. There is free speech, for we are an aggressive, tough-minded people who never hesitate to speak our minds. Still, the fact remains that we homeowners have our rights too, and I, for one, am going to stick up for mine. From its beginning more than 300 years ago, America has been the haven of the oppressed who found religious freedom here. Dotting the landscape in city, town, and country are church spires reaching up into the heavens. Great edifices invite worshipers to sit beneath their hushed and holy domes. Here in America, every man may worship his God according to his lights, may address the Almighty if he so pleases in the tongue of his fathers, for this is the land of the free. We Americans like to play. Laughter rings out in the land, on the beaches of the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Gulf, of lakes and rivers and streams. Millions of us are ardent devotees of the national game of baseball. On each coast is a great exposition to teach us, amuse us and amaze us. One has arisen outside of New York City on the Flushing Meadows, the other on Treasure Island in beautiful San Francisco Bay. All the year round, the out of doors calls us, bidding us forget all care and live an hour or two with nature in her ever-changing wonderland, always fascinating whether in the crisp cold of winter or on a soft June evening out in the woods. Back in 1900, men were still doing many laborious tasks by hand. Then came the beginning of a new program of action, the American Way, which consists of an endless chain of four links, endless because no one can say which comes first. One link was quantity production, by which products of finer quality were produced in greater numbers at a price within the reach of everybody. General education was essential to the American way so the people could learn the advantages of a product from magazine advertising, from newspapers that daily tell a hundred sales stories, from billboards that display a message so that he who runs may read, and from the radio that takes education directly into the home. Now we have national desire exemplified by a hurrying stream of shoppers. Quantity production means a product that combines high quality with low cost returning more value on the investment, whether it's an automobile or a cake of soap. Nationwide distribution means laying down the product in every community for the convenience of the prospective buyer. General education is accomplished by advertising in all its forms and through all available media. Thus is engendered national desire. The result is the American way unapproached, even unique, as it operates day in and day out in furtherance of the health, happiness, and well-being of all of us, of higher standards of living than exist elsewhere in the world, here in the land of the free. This was a mighty snappy job not so long ago, only 40 years, in fact, and yet this scene almost takes us back to the dark ages. So rapid has been the growth of the automotive industry, the outstanding example of the American way in operation. In 1900, there were only 8,000 motor vehicles registered in the United States. By 1906, the number had grown to 105,000. We topped the million mark for the first time in 1913 with 1,258,000 registrations. Two years later, the total was 2,445,000, and the curve went steadily upward through the years. Three and a half million in 1916, five million in 17, Six million in 18, seven and a half million in 19, and nine and a quarter million in 1920. What a growth that was in a score of years. But it still went on and up, 
15 million in 1923, 22 million in 26, 26 and a half million in 30, 28 million in 36, and 29 and a half million last year. Think of it, in 40 years, we have built a total of 62 and a quarter million motor vehicles. And we're going to keep right on building them more and more, for Americans always have demanded and always will demand these necessities of good living. Now for the men and women who build the cars. Motor car companies employ as many as a half a million persons in a year and pay them as much as $800 million in 12 months. Another million and a quarter are employed in sales and service. And when you consider the related manufacturers who depend on the automobile business, you find on the payrolls more than six million employees. One out of every seven gainfully employed in the United States. America's road building program went hand in hand with the development of motor transportation until now we have 360,000 miles of surfaced highways. In the fiscal year of 1939, more than three and a half million men were employed on road construction and maintenance. The motorists of America fill their tanks each year with 22 billion gallons of gasoline, 90% of the total United States production. Automobile manufacturers ship their product in three million freight carloads for which they pay the railroads the staggering total of $360 million. The automotive industry writes many another big check. In a year, it spends more than $23 million for cotton. Nearly $3 million is the bill for wool, and another $2 million goes for mohair. The cattlemen receive more than one and three quarters million dollars for hides. And there are many other commodities of which the industry is the largest single consumer, such as rubber, 80%, Plate glass, 69%. Alloy steel, 54%. Malleable iron, 53%. Trip steel, 51%. Sheet steel, 41%. Lead, 35%. Nickel, 29%. Every state in the Union contributes to the building of automobiles and every state profits. New England weavers make fabrics for upholstery. From the northwest comes lumber, millions of feet of it. From the south come sugar cane and cotton, millions of pounds of it. From the southwest comes oil, billions of gallons of it. From the middle west come corn and wheat, soybeans and flaxseed, millions of bushels of it. From ranchers and farmers the country over come sheep and cattle and hogs, millions of them. From nature's bountiful storehouse of treasures in the earth come iron and lead, zinc and nickel, tin and aluminum, copper and coal, mercury and silver, tungsten and bauxite, vanadium, molybdenum, and manganese. Truly, all America builds the automobile. It's a nationwide collaboration of 48 states cooperating to achieve a common purpose. And it could happen nowhere but here, in the land of the free, where men can still dream dreams and make them come true. Close the patent office, no siree, not while there are still Americans ever striving to make this a better world to live in. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.